Uh, I'm not audible. Not through the mic. Okay. We should call Gaurav. No, where else can I? Ma'am, you are audible. They are not able to hear. Ma'am, audible. Ma'am, your voice is coming. Okay. Yeah, we can hear. Right. Hmm. What's the time? So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all to the next uh, lecture in the Science A2 series, which is being organized by RCB to commemorate 75 years of India's independence. The next speaker is Dr. Divya Chandran, and it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce her today. Uh, Dr. Divya Chandran is an associate professor at Regional Center for Biotechnology. She did her PhD in plant sciences from University of Minnesota in US, after which she moved to University of California, Berkeley for postdoctoral studies. And then she moved to RCB as an assistant professor. She has a lot of um, awards to her credit, which include Early Career Award by De Department of Science and Technology, Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award from DBT, and several postdoctoral fellowships, which she uh, earned uh, during her postdoc studies. She uh, has published in several uh, plant journals, which include Molecular Plant Pathology, to name a few, genomics and uh, cell plant physiology. Um, she is uh, currently, her group here in RCB is involved in deciphering the interactions between fungus and uh, plants using uh, genomics, functional genomic approaches and genetic approaches. And today she will talk to us about uncovering the molecular mechanisms of powdery mildew resistance in legumes. So I welcome Dr. Divya to give her talk. Thank you, Deepthi. Uh, am I audible at the back? Okay. So thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, as Deepthi said, uh, very broadly in my research program, we study the molecular interplay between a fungal pathogen that is commonly known as powdery mildew and its host leguminous plant with the long-term goal of engineering durable resistance against this disease in legumes of agronomic import. Okay, so uh, in our lab, we focus on Erysiphe pisi, which is the predominant fungal species that causes powdery mildew disease in a number of legume crops. Uh, Erysiphe pisi can infect grain legumes such as pea, lentil, and fava bean, 
as well as forage legumes such as Medicago truncatula, alfalfa, and vetch. And it reduces crop yield by up to 50% annually. Now, as I said, this disease is commonly known as powdery mildew because it produces white powder-like disease symptoms on the surfaces of the aerial parts of the plant only, such as leaves, stems, and fruits. And an important feature of this fungus is that it's a true obligate biotrope, which means that it can only infect and survive on living host plants. So it cannot be cultured away from the plant, which makes it actually quite challenging to work with. So here I'm showing you a microscopic view of the fungus. And what you can see is that majority of the fungal structures, including the conidia and the mycelia grow epiphytically, that is on the surface of the plant, outside the plant cell wall. And the only structure that goes within the cell wall, but still remains outside the cell membrane, so it's within the host cell apoplast, is this hostorium. And hostorium is the primary infrastructure through which the pathogen secretes virulence molecules, which are known as effectors. And the main role of these effectors is to avoid recognition and to suppress the host immune response. And it's also the primary feeding structure through which the pathogen absorbs nutrients and water from the host for its growth and survival. So if you look at the life cycle of the pathogen, it's composed of four well-defined infection stages. So in the first stage, when a conidium lands on the surface of the plant, it germinates and produces a germ tube. And at the tip of the lobe-like structure develops, which is known as the aprosorium. And this aprosorium allows the fungus to attach itself to the leaf surface and also to penetrate the host cell wall. So this stage, which is known as penetration, occurs typically between nine and 12 hours post inoculation. Now, if the penetration is successful, then the penetration peg invaginates the host cell plasma membrane and develops into this hostorial structure. And as I said previously, this hostorial structure is the main site through which effectors are secreted, and it's also the primary feeding structure through which nutrients are absorbed. So the primary hostorium typically fully develops by about 24 hours post-infection. Now, if it absorbs nutrients, then the colony expands uh, basically by producing extensive surficial mycelia as well as secondary hostoria. And by about five days post inoculation, the fungus reproduces asexually to produce conidiophores, which bear these conidia at their tips. A single colony can produce up to thousand of such um, reproductive structures. And this is what gives the disease its white powder-like appearance. So these conidia are then readily disseminated by wind to initiate new infection cycles. So traditionally, the disease is controlled through the application of fungicides. However, this is not a very eco-friendly solution. And also there's a risk of these uh, fungi developing resistance to these fungicides. So an alternate and more sustainable approach has been to breed for genetic resistance. However, in the case of legumes, very few resistance genes have been identified against this pathogen. For example, if you look in P, um, so far, only three resistance genes have been identified, which is ER1, ER2, and ER3. And ER1 has been extensively used in breeding programs because of its durability. However, a breakdown in resistance against ERs has already been reported for a number of um, powdery mildew species. Therefore, there is a need to identify novel sources of resistance against this pathogen in legumes. Therefore, the goal of our research program is to identify novel molecular targets in order to engineer durable resistance against this disease in agriculturally important legumes. So for this, we have three major objectives. One is to identify the host resistance factors that limit or prevent the growth of this pathogen. So in this aspect, we are looking at two major points. One is to identify the factors that are involved in early penetration and post-penetration response. So we're trying to limit the growth of the pathogen at an early stage. Second is uh, to look at the factors that can alter the levels of sugars at the infection site with the idea that either we can starve the pathogen by limiting sugar availability at the site or by enhancing sugar mediated defense responses. The second major objective is to identify host susceptibility factors. Now, being an obligate biotrope, this pathogen depends on certain host compatibility factors for its pathogenesis. So we anticipate that if we target such host susceptibility factors, we can perturb the infection process. So in this aspect, we are looking at two major um, areas. One is the role of host nuclear movement in susceptibility, because we recently reported that the 
host nucleus in the infected cell repositions closer to the site of penetration and then associates with the fungal hostorium. And if we block this nuclear movement, the pathogen is not able to develop the fungal hostorium anymore. So we are interested in identifying the factors that regulate nuclear movement in response to infection. And another aspect that we're looking at is the host factors that impact fungal sporulation with the idea that if we can limit sporulation, we can limit spread of the disease. The third major objective is to identify the pathogen, uh, pathogen virulence determinants, which are the effectors, because they play a very important role in determining the outcome of the interaction. So to address our goals, we use Medicago truncatula as the host system. And this is an excellent model to study legume biology because it has all the attributes that a model species should have such as a short life cycle, a small deployed sequenced genome, and abundant genomics and genetic resources that will enable both forward and reverse genetic approaches. But most importantly, it also has an inherent genetic diversity uh, in its germplasm when it comes to powdery mildew resistance. So you have Medicago truncatula accessions that are highly resistant, moderately susceptible, and highly susceptible to the powdery mildew pathogen. So at the, micro, at the macroscopic level, you can see that on the resistant genotype, there are no disease symptoms that are used. In the moderately susceptible genotype, you have moderate symptoms. And in the highly susceptible one, you have symptoms. And at the microscopic level, on the resistant genotype, the pathogen growth is arrested at this apressorial stage, that is at the pre-penetration stage. So it's not able to grow beyond that. However, it's able to complete its life cycle on both the moderately susceptible and susceptible genotype but the growth is significantly delayed. Growth and reproduction is delayed in the moderately susceptible genotype. So we use these genotypes to dissect the molecular and genetic basis of resistance against this disease. So to identify the factors that are involved in this early penetration response, what we did is we started with an unbiased discovery-based approach in which we performed the genome-wide transcriptome profiling of resistant and susceptible medical goat truncatula genotypes um, in response to powdery mildew infection at one day post inoculation in order to identify the biological processes that are differentially regulated between these two genotypes. So an analysis of this data indicated that the secondary metabolism pathway leading to the synthesis of isoflavonoids was significantly perturbed in both uh, data sets in response to infection. So what are these isoflavonoids? So they are a sub-branch of the flavonoid group of phenolic compounds that are almost exclusively synthesized in these legume uh, species of plants through the phenylpropanoid pathway. So when we looked at the expression of the individual genes in this pathway in the resistant and susceptible genotype, we found that a greater number of genes were significantly upregulated in the resistant type. And in cases where they were differentially regulated in both genotypes, the magnitude of expression was always higher in the resistant genotype. So here I'm showing it in, uh, as a heat map where you can see that red indicates high expression and blue indicates low expression. So therefore we wanted to explore the role of this isoflavonoid pathway in early penetration resistance in Medicago truncatula. So for this, we selected uh, two genotypes, the highly resistant genotype A17, the moderately susceptible genotype R108, and we captured the changes in gene expression as well as metabolite accumulation of this isoflavonoid biosynthetic pathway uh, until 24 hours post inoculation. So we selected this time point because we want, at this time point, the pathogen growth is arrested at the appressorial stage in A17, Whereas in the susceptible genotype, it's able to penetrate, form a hostorium, and then a hyphal peg. So you're not able to see this heat map, but um, what I want to show you here is the expression level of the individual pathway genes in response to powdery mildew infection in the resistant and the susceptible genotype at different early time points after powdery mildew infection. So you can't see it here, but you just have to trust me, which is that 
when we compare the expression profiles of both genotypes, we found that majority of the pathway genes were significantly induced at earlier time point in the resistant genotype, that is between six and 12 hours post inoculation, which are the time points at which the pathogen attempts to penetrate the host cell. However, the infection dependent expression of the same genes was slightly delayed and it occurred mainly between 12 and 24 hours post inoculation in the moderately susceptible genotype. So this indicates that the uh, isoflavonoid pathway genes are induced earlier in the resistant genotype in response to infection. And in particular, the genes that are involved, that encode enzymes involved in these final steps of the pathway leading to medicarpin synthesis were um, differentially expressed in the resistant and the susceptible genotype. So to check whether this transcriptional induction then translates into metabolite accumulation, we quantify the levels of the different pathway metabolites in the resistant and susceptible genotype at different time points of infection, powdery mildew infection using LCMS. So here the black bar represents the resistant genotype and the blue bar represents the susceptible genotype. So in general, you can see that in response to powdery mildew infection, there was significant accumulation of all of the pathway metabolites in both genotypes. However, there were differences in the kinetics of accumulation between the two genotypes. So if you particularly look at the uh, metabolites that are involved in the sub-branch leading to medicarpin synthesis, here I have highlighted them in gray, what we found was that the isoflavone and isoflavonone intermediates uh, showed higher accumulation in the moderately susceptible genotype, whereas the end product of the pathway and its immediate precursor, which is 2 methoxy formononetin, showed higher accumulation in the resistant genotype. So what this indicated was that the intermediate metabolites are being converted more rapidly and efficiently in the resistant genotype in response to powdery mildew infection compared to the susceptible genotype. Therefore, this leads to an earlier induction of medicarbon in the resistant genotype as compared to the moderately susceptible genotype. Okay, so since we had found that there was differential expression between these, you know, the last pathway steps in the resistant and the moderately susceptible genotype, we tested whether if we silence this IFR gene in the resistant genotype, whether we would be able to compromise this penetration resistance. So we used an RNA interference approach to transiently silence IFR in the resistant genotype, and then quantified the fungal load on the silence lines by measuring the fungal 18S ribosomal RNA transcript abundance. So we found a decrease in the fungal load on the silenced lines, but this decrease was not statistically significant. So to see which stage it was particularly impacting, if at all, we performed a microscopic analysis. And what you see here is as opposed to the GFP silence control lines where the pathogen growth was again arrested at the appressorial stage, in the IFR silence lines, the pathogen is now able to penetrate, produce a hostorium, and develop a hyphal peg. And this phenotype resembled what we had seen in the moderately susceptible genotype. So this um, indicated that transient silencing of IFR in the resistant genotype can lead to a breakdown of powdery mildew penetration resistance. We then wanted to see if we overexpress this pathway in the susceptible genotype, whether we would be able to confer powdery mildew resistance. Uh, for this, we identified a MIP transcription factor um, that showed much higher expression in the resistant genotype as compared to the susceptible genotype in our RNA-seq data in response to powdery mildew infection. And this particular MIP, it shows very high sequence identity to a soybean MIP that was previously characterized as a positive regulator of isoflavone synthesis. So MIP transcription factors, they are known to regulate the synthesis of many secondary metabolites by coordinating the expression of the different biosynthetic genes. So we thought that if we can overexpress this MIP transcription factor, we'll be able to enhance the isoflavonoid levels in the susceptible plant and then enhance its disease resistance. So when we transiently 
overexpressed MIB in the moderately susceptible genotype. We found a significant upregulation of the transcript levels, uh, also protein levels, which I'm not showing here. And we confirmed that the localization of this MIP transcription factor occurs in the nucleus, validating its role as a transcription factor. When we examined the um, transcript abundance of the IFR, the isoflavonoid pathway genes in the MIP overexpression lines, we found a significant upregulation of almost all of the pathway genes in the overexpression uh, leaves as compared to the empty vector controls. Now, whether this translates into metabolite accumulation also was checked. And this was checked by quantifying the levels of the different isoflavonoid metabolites. And what we found was that levels of formononetin, which is an important intermediate that leads to medicarpin synthesis and medicarpin itself was significantly higher in the MIB overexpression line as compared to the empty vector controls. So since we had uh, successfully overexpressed or enhanced the levels of isoflavonoids, we wanted to see if this can impact powdery mildew resistance. So what we found was that a greater percent of conidia were now arrested at the apparatorial stage on these MIB overexpression lines as compared to the empty vector controls, indicating that this pathway plays a very important role in powdery mildew resistance. To further validate the role of this pathway in powdery mildew resistance, we used a different approach where we exogenously infiltrated the individual isoflavonoids into the moderately susceptible genotype. And then after three hours after treatment, we inoculated them with powdery mildew and then quantified the fungal load. So what we found was that pre-treatment with either medicarpin or the intermediate metabolite that lead to the formation of medicarpin showed significantly reduced fungal load. So this could either mean that these individual components also have an antifungal role, uh, a direct antifungal role, or it could be through their conversion into medicarpin, which is the end product of this pathway. So that we were not able to decipher with this experiment, but this supported our hypothesis that the isoflavonoid pathway, and in particular medicarpin, may be involved in penetration resistance against powdery mildew. So to further confirm the role of medicarpin, we infiltrated increasing concentrations of medicarpin into this moderately susceptible genotype and quantified the fungal load. And what we found is that medicarpin pretreatment could reduce powdery mildew growth in a dose dependent manner. And at these concentrations that we used for the experiments, we found that medicarpin treatment alone did not cause any cytotoxicity in the plant. And this was through tripan blue staining, which stains for dead cells, and DAP staining, which stains for hydrogen peroxide accumulation. Then we checked which stage was particularly, particularly impacted by medicarpin treatment. So as opposed to the mock treatment in which the fungus was able to penetrate and form hyphal structures, we found that in medicarpin treated leaves, most of the conidia were arrested at the appressorial stage. And this result was quantified in this graph. So you can see that almost 70% of the conidia were arrested at the appressorial stage in the medicarpin treated leaves, as opposed to only about 30% in the mock treated leaves. So this indicates that medicarpin may confer powdery mildew resistance and uh, early powdery mildew resistance in medicago truncatula. We then visualize the spatial dynamics of medicarpin in response to powdery mildew treatment in the moderately susceptible. So for this, what we did is we infiltrated a fluorophore tagged version of medicarpin into R108 leaves and then followed the infection. So what we found was that prior to inoculation, the green fluorescence of the fluorophore was uniformly distributed in all cells in both medicarpin treated as well as the mock treated leaf in which the fluorophore alone was infiltrated. But at 24 hours post inoculation, the fluorescence showed this nice concentric ring pattern directly beneath the fungal appressorium, and in cases where the hostorial complex was formed, also surrounding the hostorial complex. And this pattern was not uh, visible in the mock treated leaves alone. So this uh, observation was also quantified. And what we can see that this infection localized fluorescence was seen um, more uh, predominantly in the medicarpin treated leaves, but not in the mock treated leaves. 
So this indicates that exogenously infiltrated metacarpin can localize to the infection site, and this localization may be important for its function in resistance. So next, we wanted to see how does metacarpin confer this resistance. So for that, we looked at the impact of metacarpin treatment on infection-induced hydrogen peroxide accumulation, which is one of the earliest responses of the plant to pathogen attack, which leads to a hypersensitive response and ultimately death of the infected cell. And that's one way it can restrict the further growth of the pathogen. So for this, we use dab staining, which produces a brown colored precipitate when it is oxidized by hydrogen peroxide. So at the outset, we found that a larger number of conidia in the mock treated leaf did not show any dab staining, indicating lack of that hydrogen peroxide. But in cases where, at the infection sites where we found dab staining, we found two patterns of accumulation. One where it was restricted to the small ring uh, beneath the apressorium, similar to what we had seen for medicarpin. And in another case, in the entire infected cell surrounding the hostorial complex. While the percent of conidia that showed this ring-like pattern was similar in medicarpin and mock treated leaves, we found that a greater percent of conidia showed this enhanced hydrogen peroxide accumulation in the entire infected cell in the medicarpin treated leaves compared to mock treated leaves. So what this indicates is that medicarpin treatment can enhance infection localized hydrogen peroxide accumulation and that may lead to death of the infected cell. And that's how the pathogen is not able to grow anymore. And this data was also quantified. So you have the amount of hydrogen peroxide produced by the leaves was significantly higher in the medicarpin treated leaves as compared to the mock treated leaves. We also checked the uh, percent of conidia that could develop hostoria in the uh, medicarpin treated leaves. And we found that fewer conidia actually developed this primary hostoria in medicarpin treated leaves. So what this told us was that in addition to this post uh, penetration resistance response, medicarpin treatment may also lead to penetration resistance. Now we know that uh, secondary metabolites can regulate plant growth development as well as defense by controlling levels of phytohormones. And defense phytohormones such as salicylic acid and jasmonic acid have already been shown to play a role in inducing defense responses against the powdery mildew pathogen. So we wanted to see if the effect of the isoflavonoid pathway on resistance was occurring through alterations in the levels of some of these phytohormones. So for this, we quantified the levels of both salicylic acid and jasmonic acid in response to powdery mildew infection. Um, at different time points in the resistant and susceptible genotype. And what we found was that SA levels were induced early in the resistant genotype, not in the susceptible genotype, while the um, induction of JA levels was slightly delayed, occurring mainly at 24 hours post inoculation in the resistant genotype. Now to check whether medicarpin treatment alters this accumulation pattern, we devised a strategy where we infer the moderately susceptible leaves with medicarpin. And then three hours after treatment, we inoculated those leaves with powdery mildew. And then at 48 hours post inoculation, we assessed the powdery mildew growth. So leaves were harvested at one, three hours after medicarpin treatment, and also at this 48 hours post inoculation time point from both medicarpin treated and mock treated leaves. So as expected, since we had exogenously infiltrated medicarpin, we found that medicarpin levels were higher in, both at three hours after treatment and also at 48 hours post inoculation with powdery mildew in the medicarpin treated leaves compared to the mock treated leaves. When we looked at SA accumulation, we found that at three hours after medicarpin treatment, SA levels were significantly increased. And this increase was also visible after powdery mildew infection, but the difference between medicarpin and mock treated leaves was not statistically significant, possibly because infection can also induce SA levels even in the mock treatment. When we looked at JA treatment, we found, uh, sorry, when we looked at the JA levels in medicarpin treated leaves, there was no significant alteration in the levels of JA in uh, medicarpin and mock treated leaves, although there was an increase in response to infection. 
So from this, we could conclude that medicarpin treatment specifically induces SA accumulation. Now, to see if this effect of medicarpin on SA accumulation was due to its effect on SA biosynthesis, we measured the expression of SA biosynthetic genes, um, PAL1 and ICS1, at one hour after treatment, three hours after treatment, and then at 48 hours post inoculation with powdery mildew. So we found that levels, transcript levels of PAL1 were significantly upregulated at one hour post treatment, not, but not at three hours. And ICS1 levels were not altered at either time point. But at 48 hours post inoculation, both genes were significantly upregulated in the medicarpin treated leaves. So what this indicated to us was that after medicarpin treatment, the um, Induction in SA levels is probably dependent on the PAL pathway in the absence of infection. And in the presence of infection, both the pathways may be contributing to the induction in SA biosynthesis. In addition to synthesis, we also wanted to see if SA signaling markers were upregulated. So we wanted to see if the signaling of SA is also enhanced. So for that, we looked at the expression pattern of pathogenesis related genes or PR genes, which are known markers of SA signaling. And what we found was that majority of these PR genes were significantly upregulated both at three hours and at 48 hours post inoculation in the medicarpin treated leaves as compared to the mock treated leaves. So based on this, we concluded that medicarpin treatment can induce the expression of SA biosynthesis genes as well as signaling markers. We also wanted to see if medicarpin treatment can impact the accumulation of its own pathway metabolites. So we repeated the experiment and quantified the levels of the um, isoflavonoid metabolites, particularly those which are involved directly in its synthesis. And in general, we found that, um, as we had seen before, levels of all metabolites increased in response to powdery mildew infection, which is the 48-hour time point, in both mock and in medicarpin-treated leaves. However, if you want to look just as the, at the impact of medicarpin treatment, then the major impact was only seen uh, in the case of formononetin, which showed higher uh, levels after medicarpin treatment. We also looked at the impact of medicarpin treatment on the expression of some of the key genes involved in the synthesis of medicarpin. So we looked at IFS1, which is the key gene involved in isoflavon to isoflavonone synthesis, and IFR, which is a key gene involved in the last step leading to medicarpin synthesis. Now, surprisingly, we found only IFS levels to be significantly upregulated, and it mirrored the expression pattern that we had seen for PAL1. That is, it was significantly upregulated at one hour, not at three hours, but again at 48 hours post inoculation. But IFR levels were not significantly upregulated in any case. So what this indicates to us is medicarpin has the potential to regulate its own pathway, but there might be some genes in the pathway that might be uh, regulated in a different uh, level. Now, since medicarpin could induce SA synthesis and signaling, we wanted to see if the reverse was also true. That is, SA can in turn regulate medicarpin synthesis. So for that, we looked at the promoters of these key isoflavonoid biosynthetic genes, IFS1 and IFR. And we found uh, a couple of cis, um, salicylic acid responsive cis elements in the promoters. So to confirm these, we checked the expression of these genes in response to SA treatment. And we found that SA could induce the expression of both IFS1 as well as IFR in the moderately susceptible genotype. But when we looked at the metabolite levels, again, as expected, since we had treated the leaves with SA, SA levels were higher, both at three hours and at 48 hours post inoculation. But when we looked at medicarpin levels, there was a slight increase in medicarpin levels in the SA treated leaves at three hours, that is prior to infection. But the difference was statistically significant at 48 hours post inoculation. So this indicates that SA can also induce the synthesis of medicarpin. Um, just like medicarpin can influence SA synthesis, but only in the context of powdery mildew infection. When we looked at JA levels, we found that SA treatment actually decreased the accumulation of SA, which is um, 
which reflects the antagonism that is seen between these two phytohormones in plants. But at 48 hours post inoculation with powdery mildew, there was no significant difference between the SA treatment and the mock treatment, indicating that J is also induced upon powdery mildew infection. So we also want to look at the in impact of SA treatment on the other metabolites of the isoflavonoid pathway. Again, like what we had seen with the medicarpin treatment, all of these intermediates showed an increased uh, accumulation, both in SA treatment as well as in mock treatment in response to powder view infection. However, if we were to just look at the impact of SA treatment, we found that only levels of the immediate precursor of medicarpin, which is 2-methoxyformanonitin, was uh, slightly increased in the SA treated leaves. Now, we previously, a gene had been identified, which was shown to confer resistance against mildew in medicargo truncatula against a medicargo truncatula isolate of the pathogen. So, this R gene is a CCNB LRR type of R gene that is constitutively expressed in the resistant genotype, but not in a susceptible genotype. So, we wanted to see if these pathways, right, the isoflavonoid pathway and the SA pathways are actually activated by this R gene because the mechanism, molecular mechanism underlying this REP1 mediated powdery mildew resistance has not yet been uh, discovered. Okay, so first we looked at the expression of REP1 in these three genotypes. So as previously shown, you can't see it here, but the levels, basal levels of REP1 was highest in A17, moderate in R108 and not detected in the susceptible genotype. And then when we silenced REP1 in um, A17 using an RNA interference approach, we found that the pathogen was able to now penetrate and form hyphal structures, which it cannot do in the control leaves. So this indicates that REP1 can confer resistance against the EPC isolate, sorry, the P isolate of EPC, which is the one that we work in our lab. So to see its impact on um, the isoflavonoid pathway, what we did is we measured the expression of the P isoflavonoid pathway genes, as well as genes involved in SA synthesis. And what you can't see here, but you have to trust me, is that the basal levels of the isoflavonoid pathway genes were significantly down-regulated in the REP1 silence genes. So when you silence the R gene REP1, then the basal levels of these isoflavonoid pathway genes is also reduced. However, similar response was not seen with the SA synthesis-related genes. So this indicates to us that REP1 may play a role in regulating the expression of the isoflavonoid pathway genes, even in the absence of infection, but its regulation on the SA pathway may be context dependent, occurring only in the presence of infection. And this is, this still has to be tested. So based on all our results, we propose a model for early penetration resistance, Medicago truncatula, where the R gene REP1, upon recognition of an yet unidentified effector, can quickly and rapidly induce the accumulation of medicapin uh, possibly through activation of this MIP transcription factor, we need to demonstrate that. But it can also lead to an activation of SA and the JA pathway. And this combined accumulation of medicarpin and SA can induce localized hydrogen peroxide accumulation that can lead to a hypersensitive response and death of the infected cell. Now, although we provide evidence that exogenous medicarpin treatment can induce SA and vice versa, we still have to perform further experiments to prove that this phenomenon also occurs during the natural course of infection where endogenous levels of medicarpin can um, induce SA synthesis and vice versa. So for this, we have some experiments that are planned. One is to use SA and isoflavonoid deficient mutants and then quantify the level of the other metabolite in that plant. Second is to check connection between this R gene and these pathways and to prove that the R gene um, molecular mechanism of resistance is through these pathways. And third, and interestingly, what we have 
uh, we will be looking at is whether the spatial proximity of the R gene and the isoflavonoid pathway enzymes plays important for its role in resistance because uh, we have preliminary evidence to suggest that REP1 is ER localized and many of these isoflavonoid pathway enzymes are also bound to the outer surface of the ER. And in response to infection, REP1 localizes to the extra hostorial membrane, that is the membrane that surrounds the hostorium. So it'll be interesting to see whether the spatial proximity uh, plays a role in the rapid induction of medicarpin, particularly in the resistant genotype. So with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge the people who have contributed to this project. Credit for this work goes to a highly motivated and hardworking student. She's a senior PhD student in the lab, Arunima Gupta. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Atul Goel and Pallavi Avasti because they provided us with the chemically synthesized medicarpin and the fluorophore tagged version of medicarpin. Dr. Nirpender and Neha from APPC for help with the LCMS experiments and RCB core instrumentation facility for other services. I'd also like to acknowledge funding sources. So we have extramural funding from CERB and DBT and intramural funding from RCB. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Who do I go with? Tushar? Yeah. Yes. So being an isoflavonoid, it has very strong antioxidant property, mm -hmm. as well as these molecule also can probably induce antioxidant uh, signaling, particularly through transcription factor. So how this molecule induced the localized uh, effect of hydrogen peroxide formation? Is yeah. there any basically mechanism or molecule which actually suppress the hydrogen peroxide that interact or like something is there? So it's actually not known. What you're saying is correct. Um, these isoflavonoids are known to have antioxidant properties and which is what we wanted to test. But then surprisingly, we found the reverse that it is enhancing the production of these um, reactive oxygen species. So it's still not clear how it exactly it is doing that. It might be just through its um, localized accumulation. There's so much accumulation at the site that that leads to this generation of reactive oxygen species, but the exact molecule binds and suppresses, that is not known yet. Like hydrogen, uh, like the, the superoxide dismutase or peroxidase, this kind of enzymes. Yeah, uh, this, yes. Have you checked that one in the localized place? Uh, so we haven't checked at the localized place, but there is evidence in literature which suggests that many of these peroxidases are overexpressed in uh, or upregulated in response to infection. But whether that particularly happens at the site is something that we have not checked yet. Okay. Sorry, Deepak, uh, the mic is here, so I'll just quickly ask. So, uh, so Divya, you said that rep one is upstream of the metacarpin biosynthesis, right? Is there any evidence? Uh, I mean, I might be wording it wrong, but. That's how you show it in the model. Could yeah. the reverse also be possible? Can medicarpin affect rep one levels? Yeah, so I have to mention that you know we have put rep one in the model, done enough to confirm where it is in the pathway. Mm -hmm. But uh, since it is constitutively expressed in the resistant genotype, even you know in the absence of infection, so the levels are always high in the case of the resistant. Okay. But the medicarpin synthesis is only activated upon powder mildew infection. So mm -hmm. we think that this rep one is already ready and it is recognizing something from the pathogen, maybe an effector or something, and then acting the medicarpin synthesis. So would it make sense at all to think of a co-treatment, rep one reduction as well as medicarpin treatment? Mm -hmm. Could that, if there is an independent rep one, independent way in which medicarpin is acting, mm -hmm. you might see additivity or some such thing. If they're in the same pathway, you may not. So, yeah. but I don't know if the question makes sense. So we can use the susceptible genotype, which does not show rep one induction at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we provide medicarpin, there is resistance, but possibly we can just use the susceptible genotype because that's naturally does not contain right. uh, expression of the rep one. Okay. 
And just one more question. Could a mod chemically modified or rather optimized metacarpin be a treatment, uh, sort, sort of a preventive against powdery mildew disease? Yes, it could be. Since you can spray yeah. it from the outside and it seems to have an effect. I mean, that, so. that was the idea behind uh, doing this study. Okay. To see if actually spraying medicarpin could yeah. result. Yeah, it is possible. I mean, with SA treatment, we do see reduction in um, um, powdery mildew growth, but then, you know, SA also has other pleiotropic effects. So too much of something may not be very good for the plant. Divya, what, what do you think is the level of conservation of this medicarpin pathway mm -hmm. in the plant kingdom? Do you think it's conserved only in legumes or do you see it happening in other plants also? So different plant species, I mean, many of them have all these secondary metabolite pathways, but they produce distinct metabolites. So within the legume species, there is conservation of this pathway, but the end product that is produced is specific to a particular species. For example, in soybean, the end product is not carpin, it's a glycolin. So there is conservation, but then these plants utilize specialized metabolites for themselves, either for their growth or for their defense, or for the interaction with beneficial microorganisms too. So this particular pathway is more uh, it's predominantly present in leguminous species. There are other secondary metabolite pathways involved in defense produced by others. And uh, regarding Tushar's question, uh, so the ROS that is generated, uh, that is the active agent against the fungus, is it? So what is known as this ROS, it generates a hypersensitive response that ultimately triggers death of that we are indirectly connecting or okay. extrapolating that if we see localized ROS accumulation, then that will lead to cell death and prevent further growth of the pathogen. Okay. Um, so uh, the, of the three R genes, only one is known, is it? What about the other two? You said there are three loci, right? Yes, in P. So ER1, actually ER2, ER3, the gene is still not known, right? ER1 is known, it's an MLO-like gene. So it's actually a susceptibility factor. It's only present in the recessive form, then the pathogen cannot grow. So it's a susceptibility factor that is required by the pathogen for it to grow. So what is REP1 then? REP1 is, REP1 is in Medicago, Truncatula. So is it... Uh, ER is in P. Is it an ortholog or...? No, so REP... Um, ER1 is an MLO type of gene, but REP1 is a typical R uh, resistance protein, which has C and LRR type of domain. And uh, so you show that it is the medicarpin is, is synthesis is probably dependent on REP1. Is that... it's, a, it's very preliminary mm -hmm. evidence, but what we have tested is when we silence REP1, that the basal level, so we have not done it with infection, the basal levels of these isoflavonoid pathway genes appear to be uh, decreased. So we want to see if this pathway is occurring through REP1. So what about medicarpin expression in the susceptible, highly susceptible strain? Is it at all expressed? Because their REP1 expression is very low, right? Right. So this is a good point. So we have actually looked at medicarpin accumulation in the highly susceptible one also. And what we see is medicarpin does accumulate, but it occurs very late in the infection process. So what we think is it's the timing of this response that is important more than actual production of this compound. So in the resistance reaction, uh, interaction is happening very fast, right? And maybe you don't need large amounts, but at later time points, when you have more fungal load, there is more medicarpin produced, but at that time point, it is not enough to restrict the pathogen growth. It's so still how, trying, but it's not. How is that regulated? Is it is are there differences in the enhancer of the what is that IRF? IFR. IFR. Yeah. So. so there are some. These are different accessions. So there are differences uh, in the promoter regions, and that might be. We we don't know yet. We haven't looked at that yet. 
But now sequences are available for all of these ecotypes of accessions. So we can look into this more. Yeah, in line with uh, what Sam asked, has anybody tried knocking out IFR and then seeing the role on susceptibility of uh, the plant? So we did transient knockdown okay. of just IFR, but it's transient. Um, and we saw slight increase in, uh, pen in susceptibility. We did see that, but I think a stable transgenic line would give us Okay, because that will not have yes. any money. Okay. Yeah. And the other but thing it is... might be possible that just IFR itself may not, you know, have that much of an impact. If we maybe the entire pathway will have to be because that's the terminal enzyme that is leading to medicarp, and if that is not the ideally medicarp, and should not be produced. Right, and that is what I think is happening in R108, which is the moderately susceptible, because the basal expression of IFR is extremely low in this moderately susceptible. Okay. And the other thing is the MIB1 uh, transcription factor mm -hmm. that uh, you think that uh, that is reported to overexpress the isoflavonoid pathway. Yes. And that is why probably you overexpress so that it can overexpress so the downstream. It's not been shown in Medicago. Okay. So we are going to do more experiments to prove that it actually does induce. Okay. But um, based on its sequence similarity to a soybean MIB, which has been proven to be. We took it as but is it possible that MIB1 is also influencing other pathways, which is probably leading to it could, you know, susceptibility? It could. Yes. And, okay. yes. Are you going to ask type or are you in type? Uh, the, if you just look at the growth, it's not it's not that big okay. as compared to susceptible genotype, which is DCA, mm -hmm. but it is the one that has been sequenced and used worldwide as the wild type. Okay. Because, because if you plan to apply this medicarpine to enhance biomass or yield by crop protection, right. I wonder if it is makes a susceptibility or the reduces the yield or the growth, hmm. then how do you so that, see that's this? That's a good point. So those kind of experiments have to be done to see if you know, you're overproducing a particular metabolite, it could have an impact on plant growth. Yeah. And it could also lead to cytotoxicity. So it will be important to modulate when it is produced and where it is produced. I think localized production would be better rather than just, but we have to see if we spray and there's a reduction in plant growth. Okay. That Those tests have not been done yet. Yeah. So another last question is that uh, why this uh, exogenous spray of medicarpine is inducing IFS1 because it's supposed to be a penultimate step of medicarpine production. Sorry, can you just repeat that? The medicarpine Why? application uh -huh. is inducing IFS1 expression, right? It's the penultimate enzyme where conversion of medicarpine is happening. No, 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 no. IFS is in the beginning. IFR is the penultimate. Okay, even, even there. Uh, but if, it was not inducing IFR. Yeah, but IFS1 is inducing. Yes, yes. If medicarpine is already or given externally, extra, mm -hmm. extra amount, mm -hmm. why the cell requires such kind of an induction of IFS1? That's uh... Yeah, so we, it might be positively regulating its own pathway, the synthesis of its own uh, pathway, and it could be through the assay because medicarpine can increase assay and assay can increase medicarpine. So it might be a feed forward amplification loop that we are seeing. But these are all hypotheses that we need to test further. Yes, so IFS is more upstream and it can lead to um, the production of, it's the first committed step towards isoflavonoid synthesis. But as I told you, the branch that leads to medicarpine synthesis is another parallel branch, which leads to the synthesis of genistein. So very nice work, Dibya. So first question was just curiosity. So is this fungus uh, in fact uh, plants other than pea or legumes? So, so this powdery mildew, um, this particular powdery mildew species mm -hmm. is legume specific. So is but the, there are multiple, there are many powdery mildew species that can infect different crops. But different crops. Okay. Yeah. So these, uh, you know, plant leaves have some specific texture or some chemical which attract these type of fungus or then what is that? <laughs> Attracting, I don't know, but there are reports which which suggest that the waxy surface on mm -hmm. the leaf help in the conidial germination. But attracting them, I'm not sure. Okay. So another question, like a nuclear movement towards historia. Mm -hmm. So that is a beneficial for plant, or if this fungus makes some create some effector and use the you know host machinery to develop itself. So what's that? 
So, so I think it's the second, the latter, mm -hmm. which is this is um, it has been well studied in different, especially non-host interactions, mm -hmm. and they have shown that this nuclear movement happens even in a non-host interaction, and there they say it is involved in a resistance response. Okay. Right. Focal accumulation mm -hmm. of you know all cell ordinals and the uh, cytoskeletal rearrangement that leads to um, blocking of further growth of the pathogen. But uh, I think the pathogen has mm -hmm. hijacked this host Mission. resistance response for its own benefit in the case of this obligate biotroph. Okay. And yeah, next time I will talk about that story when we okay. have more. So another question, like your mid beef is in a transcription effect. When you overexpressed it, is there any effect on the plant itself? So yeah, it's a good question. But since we have done transient expression, mm -hmm. so it was just in the leaf and it's a very transient assay, we did not see any changes. But if we make stable transgenic lines, it's possible that there might be. So the last uh, two genes which overexpressed you know, over in the resistant uh, variety, then the susceptible. If you overexpress them, can you make the susceptible to the resistant and just on the last two genes of this as of the pathway? It, it's possible. Okay. It's possible. So another, like, you know, yes. this is assay responsive element in those. Mm -hmm. So is this uh, regulated by this uh, assay or by myodicarpin? If you make the mutations and then analyze that, what could be the direct, you know, factor which regulate them? Huh. Those kinds of studies can be done to check whether okay. it's a direct effect or not. Okay. Yeah, Thank we, you. We haven't, we haven't gone to the okay. level yet, okay. but okay. these are good suggestions for future directions. Thank you, Dibhi. Yeah. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. So, uh, what you are uh, telling is basically, is it specific to the uh, the, the particular plant, like you know, the uh, the medic uh, mm -hmm. tranquitula med yes, whatever yes. You That's are why using it's it? called medicarpine. Uh, so, yes. is it medicarpine? It's specific to the infection of this plant, or like the pop questions, basically what you mentioned. No, other no. kind of plant like the, the, like if you can say peas hmm. can you use also medicarpine for treatment hmm. so is it ubiquitous for all kinds of infection or the specific to this particular plant no medicarpine has been shown to confer resistance against other fungal pathogens in medicago truncatula but your what you're asking is if we apply medicarpine on pea on a different yeah, plant is different huh? so that is something we have to test because as, as is the last the... component of the your uh, biosynthetic yes, pathway, yes, yes. so maybe the component derived from the other basically host that will be responsible for inhibition. Yes. So that is what people have shown, but the cross thing where we're taking medicarpine and putting it, let's say, on P and then checking pathogen growth is something we need to test. And we anticipate that it might provide protection if the pathways are conserved. Yeah. That through the essay pathway and all of these things. So the circle will have to be stopped some sometime it's because okay. the mic has come back to me now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just some small things I thought of. One is the ROS thing. Coming back to the ROS, mm -hmm. since you think that is one of the or maybe the major mediator of uh, resistance, hmm. could you treat with medicarpine but somehow also quench the yes. ROS yes. and yes. see if you still see a response? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, yes. Is that it's doable? It's doable. So that if it, if it has some other pathway also, you might be able yeah, to yeah, yeah, and yeah. quantify the responses. So that could be one thing. Mm -hmm. The other is, uh, and forgive me if I've asked you this before, um, could medicarpine be acting in the fungus also? The way you do your, since it's an obligate pathogen, which cannot grow without the host. Yeah, this question has been asked not only by you, by many people. It, it is possible. It is okay. possible. So when we look at the fluorophore tagged medicarpine, Sometimes we see a little bit of it in the apressorium mm -hmm. also. But since we can't grow it separately, we don't know the direct impact. But it is possible that medicarpine can act directly on the fungus. On the fungus. So I I didn't catch how you do the assay. Like, do you first treat the leaf with medicarpine, let it penetrate, and then infect? Yes, yes. Three hours after medicarpine treatment, we infect. Okay. And is it known how medicarpine gets into the plant cell? past the cell wall, et cetera? No, because it is endogenously produced by the plant. Only right. we have, yeah, we haven't looked at it. We have confirmed that it is going in because we have quantified the levels in the exogenous stated um, okay. leaves. But how exactly it is going in? Because if it can penetrate the plant cell wall, 
it could potentially also penetrate the fungal I mean, cell wall, right? Yeah. Or are there differences between these? There are these differences. Two? There are there differences, differences in okay. the uh, composition of the fungal cell wall and plant cell wall. Okay. Yeah. And do so by extension of the question, do does the fungus also have medicarpin biosynthetic genes? No. That might no, no. it doesn't. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Vivya for this amazing talk. And uh, now I want to invite all of you, all the students, postdocs, project staff, whoever is sitting here, please come and join us for tea. Feel free to ask more questions, involve in discussions with the speaker and the other faculty. Since there's a event going on by